tell them what to do, and when you are there, I'm going to tell you what to do. <laughs> I get I don't need a suggestion. Praise God, how's everybody doing? Who's ready to worship God? Say amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. God, your love to us is precious. Lord, we sent that. Pour it out on us. And be the steep in your presence. As we praise you and worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
go and participate in communion, that you would bless and sanctify this time, that the emblems would be sanctified by you. For we recognize your body in it. We recognize it. This commemorates the sacrifice you made on the cross. We realize and we recognize this is your body and this is your blood. And we are touched by you and we are washed by your blood as we partake together. So we release you now to get up out of your seats and move back to not only get communion, but if you need prayer for healing, you need prayer for provision, blessing, protection, whatever your need is, me and the elders are here to pray for you. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The around the King Rode in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice
Good morning, everybody. And the, and the way of announcements, this week we have, I believe, we have a birthday. Birthdays. Matt, is birthday is Wednesday, am I wrong? Wednesday is the 10th. Wednesday is the 10th? Yes. <laughs> and then um, on Saturday, we have events, 9 to 11. 10 to 4. And then um, on May, um, May 20th, Sunday, Memorial Day weekend, May 28th, the Zion Lions have their first bike ride around the island, over the hill, and through the woods. <laughs> and then um, June 11th, we're going down the calendar, June 11th, now we're in June. June 11th is our joint service with Life Church, 5 p.m. So that morning, there will be no morning service. There's only one service at 5 p.m. I want to make sure everyone, we don't have two services that we have one service at 5 p.m. I know, right? What else do I have? Nothing else. No, and then if you have, if you don't know, because I've officially put in my request at work, it hasn't been approved, but I put it in, so I hope I get it. August fourth, fifth, and sixth, it's family camp. So if you need to request it off, do so now, so you don't miss out. And then also we have, um, that's for all the pertinent stuff on our calendars. Yeah. We have a new face in the house. Would you like to introduce yourself? I don't know her name. I didn't. Oh, it's Gabby's friend. Gabby, introduce your friend. This is Andrea. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> you get the good news in the gospel and in candy. She's a military staff. And then um, today after service. <laughs> she's, she's a military wife as well. Yay. <laughs> I'm not a military wife anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, as of Friday. His official, as of Friday, his Mike is no longer in a Marine in the military. He has a new job. And then, um, oh, also, um, for this, on um, today, after service, we have a child care meeting. It's going to be short. So if you, have any, if you have any interest or have been serving um, with the children of this church, hang out after service. We're going to have a short meeting. And then Wednesday night, we'll be here. Uh, 6 o'clock dinner, 6.45 is service. Be there or be square. Yes, it wasn't officially changed. We just end up cruising for a little bit longer, and then it becomes 6.50, and then it becomes 6.55. That's why my slide is current. <laughs> now it's not 6, it's 6.45. It was 6.45-ish. Now it's 6.45. But you took off the ish? No, not yet. <laughs> but I'm just happy to have my slide. Ish service. My slide is current-ish. My slide is current-ish. Oh, yes. Gosh. So we have more time with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then we'll be here on Sunday, 8, 30, and 10. Everybody knows what's happening on Sunday, right? No, what's happening on Sunday. Okay, just reminding everybody. Okay. Does any, any, does anybody have anything else to add? Any praise reports or prayer requests? So, 
sorry. <laughs> so now we'd like to take the Lord's tithes and offerings. You and I look like we're ready to start a 60s uh, band. But anyway, praise God. Nice to have you here. Hey, Patty, how are you? All right. Everybody stretch your hands forward, please, and let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, there are needs that I am aware of in this church among people that need miracles this very day. And yet there is giving here. Yet there is faith that your word has told us we can give expecting to receive. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would pour out in abundance blessing and provision 
in Jesus' name. You can see faith here. I, I only see paper, but you, you in the spirit, you see faith. So Lord, reward that faith. Bless your people in Jesus' name. And God, as we turn to your word this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would begin to move even now. That, Lord, we would be washed by the water of your word this morning. That we would be transformed by its power and its clarity. And our prayer, and if this is yours, just whisper amen to the Lord. Our prayer is that we would not leave here the same as we came in. But that your word would draw us closer to you. Your word would encourage us and give us power and comfort and strength and encouragement and direction that we might be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 Okay, so this morning, what we've been talking about for the last few weeks is in fulfillment of what we felt as a church was direction from the Lord at family camp last year. And that is to focus upon three things in 2017. Number one, to kill the old man. Number two, to get in shape. And number three, to prepare for departure. All three of those things are spiritual applications. We've talked a lot about eliminating those carnal things in our life. Now we are on to the section about getting in shape. And last week we began talking about the first step in getting in shape is addressing your nutrition, your spiritual nutrition. We started talking about spiritual food, but I realized this last week, before we get into spiritual food too deeply, we need to talk about hydration. I was reminded by uh, 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 a chiropractor slash bodybuilder kind of guy that water is vital to nutrition. If you are not properly hydrated, you actually can't metabolize the nutrition that you take in, regardless of the quality of the food, regardless of the balance of it, you must be properly hydrated for your body to properly metabolize. And I thought to myself, yeah, you know what? You're right. So we need to talk a little bit about water. We need to talk about the refreshment that every believer needs. The hydration, basically, the living water. What the living water is, how do we get it, how do we, how do we, how do we get it purified within us to operate uh, uh, in our quote-unquote spiritual m- metabolism the way we need to. And as I prayed about it, I felt like the Lord was leading me in this direction. Turn with me, please, to Galatians chapter 3, starting with verse 26. And I want to remind you, by the way, that the two messages, the one at 8.30 and 10, are going to be the same. Uh, I, I, I basically wound up fa- finding that having si- uh, section A at the 8.30 and section B at the 10, th- 10 o'clock wasn't really working. Uh, and regardless of what side of it you were on, if you could only see, if you could only hear one, you felt kind of left out. And I began feeling as though the church was increasingly getting theologically imbalanced and, and, out, and out of uh, uh, harmony. And so uh, I'm committed to presenting the same message at the 8.30 and the 10. So, as we're talking about the living water, as we're talking about what refreshes, as we're talking about how God pours that out upon us, I felt compelled to remind you of what many of you understand, and that's contained in Galatians chapter 3, starting with verse 26. It says, for you are all. Who's you? All you guys, for you. So the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, the apostle, says, for you are all. Now, that is an interesting word to use. Ponta is the Greek word for all. And it means that he is about to say something that people apply on their own to mean all. When we hear the word all, all you people, what do you think that means? Was I speaking to all you Hawaiians? All you people who drove here? All you people who are within walking distance? All you people who have iPhones? All you people who are uh, uh, of mixed origin or race? All you people who are female? All you people who are male? All you people who regularly attend CCI? All you people who are Christian? All you people who got saved when you were children and got discipled? All you people who got saved when you were an adult? All you who, to the Jewish audience that was listening to this, they were an exclusionary elitist bunch. 
They were of the mindset and they were locked into that blessings and promises of power tech oh is it oh well I want to talk to you and I can't just talk to them well, because there's more people here and the ship is going to tilt this way and it's going to sink. Um, all right. So anyway, the, the, what, what, what they're talking about here is... There you go. You got it. Yeah. They were exclusionary. They were very elitist. See, they... Uh, see, this... And they're going to put you in charge of the whole thing. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I've been praying for that, you know. Sure, why not? The more the merrier. <laughs> the, um, yeah, I know. Sometimes the board, because it's uh, metal, blocks the uh, line of sight between, uh, especially since I put the receiver thing on my butt. The, huh? Well, see, now you know what they're like. This is what they go through every week. Don't worry, sweetheart. When we get home, I'll, sh I'll show you special things. <laughs> See, now I've got to get spiritual again. That's you know, going horrible places. They were exclusionary. Paul was talking to a group of Jews that did not see Gentiles as part of the blessables. He was talking to a group of Jews that Frankly, their opinion of what heaven would be did not include Gentiles. When they thought of heaven and an afterlife that was pleasurable and pleasant, it did not include being surrounded by Romans. It did not include being surrounded by Scythians. It did not include being surrounded by Greeks. What they wanted was a very Jewish heaven. And any intrusion of the unclean, pagan, heathen, Gentile nations to them was an abomination. How on earth do you have heaven, real heaven, with all these Filipinos around? How is that going to work? Angels stirring the Diniguan and that smell wafting through the whole cloud. Oh. And God here, the Holy Spirit, is about to introduce something that is a staggering concept. For all of you are all sons of God, huios, people who are like him, people are of his blood, his spiritual blood, his spiritual stamp and identity is upon you. For all of you are sons of God, how? How do we become sons of God? How do we become included in this family? How do we, how do we all become included in this group that God the Holy Spirit is about to address through the Apostle Paul. It says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Hamashiach, Yehoshua, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Christ, Christos, Messiah. Your belief and your understanding that Jesus was the anointed one sent by God to reconcile man to himself. Understand it and say amen if you do that he is the son of God. That he died for your sins on the cross according to scripture. That he rose again three days later. That he ascended to the right hand of the father. If you believe that, and if you believe in Christ Jesus, then what is about to be said is for you. He is now redefining, he's defining the group. When I say you all, this is what I mean. I'm talking to you all who believe in Christ Jesus. For all of you, he goes on to say in verse 27, were baptized into Christ, all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself 
with Christ. Do you understand what spiritually happened to you the moment you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You're not going to see it because we see in the physical. You're not going to perceive it because we hear in the physical. But you clothe yourself with Jesus. So when God looks at you, he does not see Brian O'Neill. He does not see all our past failures, Brian. He doesn't see all our errors. He doesn't see all our mistakes. He doesn't see the unclean thoughts. He doesn't see the false uh, 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 counterfeit agendas that we have. He doesn't see any of those flaws that we see in ourselves that grieve us and go, God, how could God love somebody like me? Instead, when he looks at you in the spirit, he sees his son Jesus standing in front of you, blocking. You are clothed in Christ. He cannot see past that. There are many things that God cannot do in order to be God. He can't lie. He can't lose. He can't be destroyed. He cannot see your sins when they're covered by the blood of Jesus. He cannot see you when you're praying in Jesus' name. Who he hears and who he sees is his son instead. And your understanding of that is what is supposed to transform your praise and your worship and your prayer. This is where the power comes from. Is our understanding that because we believe in Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his name, we are clothed with him. So this is the group that he's talking to. How many of you are included in this group? Say amen. Amen. You are clothed with Christ. You are saved by his blood. You are filled by his spirit. Now what is about to come is to you. And he goes on to say, there is neither Jew nor Greek. What are you talking about? How can there be neither Jew nor Greek? There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For all of you, remember who the all of you are, are one in Christ Jesus. This was an alien thought to these people. This was beyond oddball. This was unthinkable. That God no longer sees the Jews as a geographical, uh, 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 de- geographically defined group, or a culturally defined group, or a genetically defined group, but as a spiritually defined group. What makes you a Jew, according to this, is being in Christ Jesus. That's what the new definition of a Jew is. There is no longer any Gentile or Jew. I don't see that anymore. There is neither any slave nor free. It does not matter what degree you have or don't have. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. It doesn't matter what social caste you come from. Any of the social identifiers that you and I carnally utilize to delineate between one group and another and separate and exalt ourselves above the rest, God does not see anymore. He doesn't recognize that anymore. More to the point, he doesn't want us to see it either. He wants us to see one facet of identification. Those who are in Christ Jesus and are clothed in him. This is the group that I'm talking about. This is the group that I want to deal with. These are where the blessings are going to come. This is where my protection is going to go. This is where my anointing is going to flow. This is the group that I want to deal with. And I want you, through the virtue of this passage, to identify yourself this way, to look around and realize we are all the all. We're it. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Humes eis este. You are all one. You are all the same. You are the same entity to me. You are the same identifiable group to me. To identify a difference in the group either by culture 
either by status or by gender. I cannot tell you how rocking this was that you, how old are you now? 25? What? 21? What do you think I said, 25? That you, a 21-year-old female, would be the same as I am. An old man. <laughs> Chinese, no make difference, you. You have a Chinese or you have a Japanese, no make difference. Puerto Rican may be different. I don't know. But <laughs> somebody, somebody have to sweep floor. <laughs> Plenty of angel for that. Don't worry. But here's the point. That, see, that's the thing. You and I, as we apply our lives, our assets of love, energy, time, money, we apply these things through the criteria of what we use carnally as separators. And what God is saying is there are no more Jews or Greeks. There are no more slave or free. There is no more male or female. All are one in Christ Jesus and all are considered a part of this family. What family? What family? See, it goes on to say this, that if they're already twisted in a pretzel, now they're going to turn into a churro. I mean, they're really going to get torqued. And if you belong to Christ, it goes on to say in verse 29, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are the seed of Abraham. And heirs. There's a big word, heirs, according to the promise. What promise? The covenant promise that I made him in Genesis. You are my people. You are my treasured possession. You are the one that I died for. You are the one that I came for. You are the one that I love above and beyond anybody else in this universe. You are my treasure. Those promises you now become an heir to because you are in Christ Jesus. And a Jew reading this would go, so I'm not special anymore. You actually are, but... So is everybody who believes in Christ. I need you to see the blessed of God as a group that extends beyond the cultural or the genetic or the gender. But rather, something that is defined by their spiritual faith. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are a Jew. You are a spiritual Jew. Abraham is Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. You are Jewish. In a spiritual sense, you are. Are you genetically Jewish? No. Are you culturally Jewish? Probably not. Are you geographically Jewish? I don't even know of any real Jewish neighborhoods here in Hawaii. But here's the point that this passage is trying to make. None of those things make any difference to God. What makes a difference to God is your faith in Christ Jesus. And that is what makes you Jewish. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you are Jewish. So? So you're Jewish? So what does that mean? Does that change anything? It should. Now, why is this important? Why do I even bother bringing this up? What difference does this possibly make? Quite possibly, one of the most life-changing that you may ever entertain. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. I, the Lord, do not change. I'm the same now as I was 7,000 years ago when I created Adam and Hava in Eden. I'm the same God that saved Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that sent Moses into Egypt to bring my people out as an exodus. I am the same God that sent forth Jeremiah, Elijah, Ezekiel, 
Elisha, Samuel. I'm the same God that caused my Holy Spirit to cause the Psalms to be penned, that wrote the Proverbs. I am the same God who declared my law, my Torah to my people. Now Jesus came clearly, according to Romans and the book of John, to fulfill the law. Romans chapter 8 says, if we have faith in Christ, all the righteous requirements of the law have been fulfilled in us through our faith in him. So there's no longer any need to sacrifice animals to atone for sin. There's no longer a need to ritually wash in mikvah because we are ritually unclean. There is no need to get physically circumcised anymore because there's a circumcision of the heart that is done through the sacrament of baptism. So why do I bother to mention this? Because as we began praying early on in this service, the whole purpose of this exercise is to be pleasing to God. We love God, and we want to be pleasing to God. Adel, how much of a compulsion is that supposed to be? You and I, we're spiritually Jewish. According to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is the byline, the slogan of the uh, IF, uh, ICFG, the International Churches of the Four Square Gospel. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The reason I point these things out is because God in the Old Testament, as well as the New, reveals his heart. He shows us what pleases him. He shows us what blesses him. He shows us what he wants his people doing and not doing. He wants his people believing and not believing. He shows us how he wants us spending our assets, our time, our energy, our love. What is a blessing to him to see his people doing and what is hurtful to him when he sees his people doing. When he sees his people whoring after other gods, allowing idolatry to come in their lives, he calls that a form of spiritual idolatry. And at one point in the Old Testament, he actually divorced Israel. Wrote her a letter of divorce because her spiritual affections had gone so wayward that he could not bear the fellowship anymore. The reason I raise this point and emphasize your spiritual Jewishness is so that you understand all those promises of the Old Testament and all those instructionals that reveal the mind and the heart of God that show us how to be pleasing to him and show us how to serve him are still in force. And he still wants to see the same kind of purity in us. He still wants us to show forth that kind of love and that kind of devotion. What kind of love and devotion? What you talking about, Willis? What you mean? Let's talk about what it means to be Jewish. Since we are spiritual Jews, we should try to figure out what a Jew is. The word Jew comes from the word Judah. Judah means praise. And the word tribe of Judah comes from the Hebrew word yada, which means thanks. But yada, to just say it means thanks is a little bit insufficient. Yada means thanks that is verbalized. Thanks that is expressed. Thanks that is written. Thanks that is lauded. Thanks that is noted. If you are just simply thankful in your heart, Sue, that is not yada. Yada, in order for it to be yada, which is the root of Judah, in order for it to be yada, it has to be something that you verbally express. That people hear by the way you talk. That people can see by the way you act. That people can discern by the way you make choices and decisions. That by the way you write 
And the way you stage your life, i.e. the way you make choices and decisions and what your value system is, what's good or bad, what's right or wrong, what's appropriate or, or, or inappropriate, are all based on one thing. And that is thanks to God. At the very heart of it, what defines a Jew is not his blood, is not his circumcision, is not his geographic uh, location, is not his gender, and is not his status. What identifies a Jew and what a Jew is supposed to be is a person who recognizes, I have been created by God. And I am thankful to that God for everything I am and everything I receive. My very existence I recognize I would not have without God. And every single thing I do and every single place I go, every single dollar I spend, every single minute I spend, every single uh, bit and scintilla of effort that I've got in me and the energy that I have, the muscles that power this body, the blood that powers the muscles, all of it, I recognize has been given to me by God and I am thankful. And by every word that comes out of my mouth and every decision and choice I make, I want to express, say, write, and show I am thankful to God for who and what I am. And every single thing I do reflects this heartfelt identity that I am thankful to God and showing him thanks. That's what it means to be a Jew. A Jew is somebody who is driven by an attitude of gratitude to the God of Israel. And everything they do is like that. Everything they do is fueled like that. That's what a Jew is. A Jew is defined by their attitude, not by their practices. It is not so much, I am Jewish because I don't get drunk. It's not the fact that you don't get drunk that makes you a Jew. What makes you a Jew is, I have been created by God. The wine has been created by God. The process of fermentation has been created by God. All of it comes from God. And his word in the Old Testament and the New declares he doesn't like it when I get drunk. He doesn't mind me taking a taste. He doesn't mind me enjoying the flavor. He doesn't enjoy me drinking the wine. But he doesn't want me to get drunk. Therefore, because I love God and I'm thankful to him for my existence and I'm also thankful to him for the creation of wine and I'm thankful for the life that he gives me and the way my body is structured to where the health operates and this happens if I drink too much wine and this happens as long as I stay on this side of it, I'm okay. I'm thankful for all of that. And as a result of demonstrating my gratitude to God, I don't drink too much. See, it is not the behavior that defines him as a Jew. It is the passion within him to be pleasing to God and demonstrate his thankfulness that, demonstra that, that identifies him as a Jew. You, I remind you, are a Jew. A spiritual Jew. And if you are going to be a spiritual Jew, this is what is supposed to define us. This is the we all that the Holy Spirit is talking about in Galatians 3. We all, the people who are thankful to God. We all, the people who want to glorify God. We all, the people who believe in God, are thankful to him, and have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We are the we all. Jews are identified by their attitude and that attitude comes out in the form of verbalized expression in writing that is lauded. I.e., these are praising, worshiping, praying people. And every single prayer that the Jews say, and there is a lot of it, in Psalm 55, verse 17, one of the foundational principles of Jewish liturgy is found. It says, 
evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Based upon that, Jewish law found in Talmud and Mishnah basically says every Jew is supposed to pray at least three times a day. In the morning, sometime during the day, and at night before you go to bed. You must pray at least three times a day. And when a Hebrew prays, as defined... In the Mishnah, Barakot, how to bless God. There are a couple things that, frankly, challenge me. He makes sure that he chooses the right prayer for the right occasion. Has the right attitude. Two, when a Jew prays, he does nothing else. A Jew does not pray while he is cooking. A Jew does not pray while he's watching television. A Jew does not pray while he is on Facebook. A, pray, a, a Jew does not pray when he is on the toilet. A Jew does not pray when he is in the shower. A Jew does not recognize it is berkat. It is a blessing to God that is suitable for God unless he is focusing 100% of his attention on praying. I remind you, we are Jews. It is three, important to recite the benedictions out loud. This is verbalized thanks, yada. Yada is not something that is in your brain that you just think, but it's something that must be expressed. You can't hold it back. The Jewish heart is so filled with excitement and enthusiasm and thanks to God, he cannot hold it in. That's why Jews tend to be so excitable people. Because they are taught from the time that they are children to in song and in prayer, in liturgy and in discussion, express their gratitude to God. They are unashamed of it. And they don't understand why anybody could possibly be nervous about bringing up the subject of God in front of people. Whether it's at work or at school. I remember my Jewish friends, Gary Tucker, Willie Falk. They would sing and they would talk and they were so gregarious. I was Chinese, so I was taught to be low-key. And, you know, Willie, being Willie, was just like, hello, Wendell, well, hello, Wendell. Take it down a notch. But he couldn't see because he was raised to be a Jew. They're exuberant people because of this. Because of what fuels them. You are Jewish. It is time to stop defining yourself culturally. Oh, Japanese people are just not like that. You're not Japanese. You're Christian. You don't have Japanese blood flowing in your veins. You have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ flowing. And that redefines you as something else. Your culture doesn't define you. Your gender doesn't define you. Your social status doesn't define you. Your monetary uh, status doesn't define you. It is your faith that is supposed to define you. And this fuels this life of prayer. They pray three times a day. At least. The Jew actually experiences a day of prayer where he is constantly praying to God. But every single time he prays, he chooses the right prayer, he focuses on God only. That's why when Jesus says to go in your closet or to go into your tent, what he means is to go off alone, put on talit, that is the head covering of a man who is praying, and focus on God and God alone because this is what Jews believe God is worthy of. Modern Christians have a very odd application of reverence when it comes to prayer to God. Even when you talk to somebody in carnal leadership, whether it is a politician or whether it's a boss or a manager, president of a company or a, a, a pastor, somebody in authority, 
I'm nothing special. But very few people in this church would consider talking to me by, hey, pastor, I want to talk to you for just a second because um, I want to... I wanted to um, just let you know that... Hey, Jojo, what's up? What time is it? Okay, anyway, pastor, um, yeah, nobody talks to me like that. At least they look at me. And they pay attention, and they give respect because, you know, I'm Wendell, I'm pastor, and... But I'm just a pastor, that's all I am. You're talking to the God of the universe, and you're blowing your nose, and you're vacuuming your rug... And you're doing all these things that you feel just need to be done because they're so important. And while you're doing all this stuff, you know, as a side benefit, I'm going to chatter at God a little bit. And you lose your train of thought and you're singing this song and then you're not singing this song. You're praying to God and you're not praying to God. Jews are not like that. That thought is alien to them. They don't understand that mentality. This is God you're talking to. You're thankful to him. You love him. He is the creator of the heavens and the universe, which is why every single Jewish prayer begins with this. Baruch ata Adonai Elohinu Melach Olam. Baruch ata. Blessed are you, Adonai, Lord Elohinu, God, Malach Olam of the universe, creator of the universe. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. You bless people. We want to bless you. As we bless you, you bless us. Blessed are you. Baruch Ata. Blessed are you, Lord. I recognize that you are God. I recognize that you are the king of the universe. I recognize that you are the creator. I recognize that you are greater than I. I recognize that you are the source of all life, that you are the source of all existence. And that's why every single berkat, every single prayer of blessing that Jews pray, and there are many, you look through the whole liturgy, and there are tons of them for different occasions and different applications. All of them start pretty much with this. Say this with me. Baruch Atah Adonai Eluheinu Malek Alam One more time. Baruch Atah, Adonai Eloheinu, Malek Olam. Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe, creator of heaven and earth. They want to recognize who he is. They want to recognize what he is. They want to recognize who he is to them personally and how he relates to all of creation and to their personal creation. They take the time to recognize and apply this in every instance. This is what makes a Jew. And they spend their life, basically, in prayer. That's what it means to be a Jew. How does this tie into the living water? Is there a tie between praying praising, worshiping, and taking in the living water that can refresh you, cleanse you, encourage you, strengthen you, comfort you when you need it. And how does that work? We're going to talk about that next week. Let's pray. And why don't you stand with me just for a moment and close your eyes And for a moment, just for 60 seconds, focus on God and God alone. Ignore who is beside you and concentrate on who is within you. The Lord God of the universe, who you have access to through your salvation in Jesus. Close your eyes and lift your hands where you are. And say this with me. Baruch Atah Adonai Eluhinu Malek Olam Blessed are you Lord God of the universe the creator of heaven and earth. Thank him now for creating you. Thank you. Thank him for creating everything. 
allow yourself to recognize that he had specific purpose for you. You are not just a fish in a pond lost in a school of bait. He sees you. He knows you. There is a specific purpose he has for you. There's a reason he created you. Thank him for that. And make a commitment to him that as you live, every choice and decision you make will in some way reflect your Jewishness that I want to show you thanks and gratitude for who you are and what I am. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Bless you. See you on Wednesday night. Thanks for coming. <laughs>